Well, welcome to another edition of Press Row, joined as always by Aaron Matthews, Todd Walker, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Week 11 in the books. What did we learn from Friday and Saturday's playoff high school football games? The Whoa. MAC is really, really good. Oh, wait, we're, we've known that for decades. <laughs> we now. learned that. What's something new we ago. learned? <laughs> you must play six. You must play 48 minutes of football, not 47, or 59. More. More yeah. more. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Really, I think we learned, as far as Lima Senior is concerned, that uh, you know, getting good isn't as hard as getting really good. You know, they were good throughout the season against what turned out to be a mediocre slate. They got the last two games of the regular season and then a playoff game, and they found out what being really good or great is all about. And that's the next step now. The, the hardest step is to go from the plateau where you're just kind of good to being an actual contender. So Lima Senior knows where they need to go. That's what I learned in week 11, amongst well, other things. And I think that's probably a good thing, that Lima Senior, mm -hmm. you see what they've done First year under Mike Fell, one five and five. Second year, they go seven and f or eight and eight three, three with the, the playoff loss. So you see progress from from year one to year two. We can juxtapose or not juxtapose, but extrapolate the progress that's going to be made from year two to year three. And I think you've got Lima Senior still in a very good position, and they are in great shape to become one of those great teams in the state of Ohio, not just a good team in the track. They, the pieces are still there. They've sure. got a lot of the skill kids coming back, and it'll be another year in that system, another year in the weight room, another year developing the depth of that team. I think, you know, I think you'd agree that the step from going from laughing stock to respectability is a big step. Mm -hmm. To go from respectability to a real contender is a bigger step, and, and that's what lies ahead, and I'm sure they're looking forward to trying to make that step. Spartans will be okay going into next year. Obviously, they're losing a lot with uh, Janiel Lyles, but guys, they still return Reuben Flowers and Rico Stafford. Track next player year. of the year, offense co-offensive player <laughs> of the year. Yeah, exactly. Flowers. You know what and they? You know what they do lose, guys. That we don't talk about enough. Their entire offensive line yep. were seniors, so they will have to replace some guys there. But you know, the skill positions, most of them are back. The system is back. Uh, the coaching staff will be back. So hopefully the the confidence to move forward is also back. Playing a team twice in the, in the season, one team gets revenge, one team holds serve. As we saw on Saturday night with Columbus Grove beating Pandora Gilboa, Spencerville avenged a loss against Crestview, uh, coming, going over back to Convoy for the playoff matchup and Crestview moves on as well. It's difficult to win in the postseason and like you said, you gotta play 48 minutes. So what, what is the most surprising result from week 11? I was I was really surprised with Van Buren's win over LCC and and not just that they beat them that they really handled them I mean, that was a blowout and LCC kind of painted it over at the end getting within ten I think it was but uh, Van Buren to me that was a a real big surprise that they blew out the T-Birds uh, you know LCC is playoff tested I guess you'd say they've been in the playoffs for seven eight years in a row Van nine Buren, out of the last ten nine out of ten Van Buren had never been there. Usually uh, teams that get there the first time, they're just kind of glad to be there. Hey, here we are in the playoffs. Uh, Van Buren came out and took it to Lima Central Catholic, and that, that caught me a bit off guard. It was 42-19 at one point, guys, and obviously having done the game, I mean, Van Buren came right out, and they smacked LCC in the mouth. The opening drive came out with a little bit of a different look. Ross Adolph proved that he was a man running the football, had four touchdown runs, had one touchdown pass. On eight, where they send him in, in motion, like one of those orbit motions. They toss him the ball. He hits the receiver wide open in stride. And that was really the demoralizer as it came late in the first half. Really took the wind out of the LCC sails. The T Birds did stack on some offensive numbers in the second half when they had to go to throw in the ball and they really couldn't run the football like they wanted to. Ethan O'Connor did set the school record for most yards passing in a season. But it had to come in a loss. And guys, when you look at the T-Birds, you look at their playoff success or lack thereof recently. Since 2011, the Birds are 1-4. and four, yeah. And three of those losses are to BBC teams. That's going to be my point. How well the Blanchard Valley Conference did. They got six yeah. teams in, went 4-2. and two, And Arlington was, on paper, Arlington was supposed to blow out St. John's. That is what they ended up doing. But if you kind of read the subtext going into that game, there was some sense that perhaps St. John's could pull the upset on Arlington, that maybe they were inside the Red Devils' helmets, if you will. But Arlington quickly proved that wasn't the case. Built an early lead and then rode to the victory. Not a surprising result, but perhaps a surprising way it came out, similar to, to Crestview not having too many problems, or Spencerville not having too many problems with Crestview. I'll tell you something else, guys, from the MAC for a minute. Seeing Fort Recovery in their first playoff, yeah. 
game ever. You know, I really thought they would have trouble with Fort Laramie. I thought it would be one of those games that would come down to the wire. Maybe a late turnover would get the job. I mean, it was almost a pick 'em. You know, you could go either way in that game. But they came out and they handled Fort Laramie, and uh, now they've got the uh, the task, so to speak. Well, I really thought Local. the Mac might have only gone like three and three last week. Mm -hmm. Instead, they went five and one. Uh, impressed with what Fort Recovery did to go on the road, first ever playoff game, and get a victory at Laramie. You have to like how Minster was able to withstand a, a very tough Mechanicsburg team. Double OT. Double overtime and pick up that victory. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Game of the week and. Of the result of a MAC team beating a non-MAC opponent in Week 11 is not surprising, but the double overtime and, and when you watch the replay, I don't know if you guys saw it on our on our air. His elbow comes down on literally the half yard line, if if not so close to the goal line, is such a close play. Very exciting. What are your guys' thoughts about going for two in that overtime situation instead of playing for the third overtime? going for the, the win or the lose? I mean, we saw that in the, in, in the Big Ten last week with Northwestern. Yeah, I think if you are the underdog, you go for two as soon as you can. Uh, if you are the favorite, you don't. Uh, so I, in that situation, I don't know how you look at it. It's sometimes coaches just get a feel that you know, we need to end this or we've got a play, we run for two, they're not going to stop, right, we that's haven't shown it. Yeah. How confident you know? are you in one play? That's what it yeah. really comes well, down and, to. Well, and when it comes to high school, how confident are you in your kickers? Right, that's a big That's the other thing. In high school, sometimes you don't trust your kicker at all, yeah. so you might as well go for two. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a lot of it is the feel of the game, but you know, in the, uh, if you're the underdog, I think you always want to go for that first chance to absolutely win this thing. And that's in that situation, we can go for two and win, you do it. So all the sites are set for week 12 and every game will be played on field turf. Do we need to play these neutral site games on field turf? No. Why is that? I, I think it, by, by making these games on field turf, you're limiting where the games can be played. And, you know, in, in some cases, you've got teams that are traveling 100 miles to play at a team that's only traveling 40 miles. I a game that, that'll be on WSN, by the way. I, I get that you can't always make it exactly the midway point, but by, by forcing the games to be on field turf, you're limiting what you can do. And, and quite honestly, there are a lot of good grass fields that are available that aren't being used. Yeah, I, I think... If some of you may recall, this goes back to that game at Donnell Stadium with Columbus Grove and Harden Northern, I think it was. Mm -hmm. 04. And, and Delphi St. John's played like three games in a row on complete mud bowls. So I, I think the, the rule, the intention is there to make sure we have some fair surfaces. Uh, I'd like to see them be able to scout out these locations a little better to play on real grass at the second week, especially. You can still do the the field turf later because you're narrowing down the number of locations. But uh, there are plenty of great grass fields still out there that could handle some bad weather and, and still be a fair surface. So I would agree with Mark that case, you don't have to. Case in point, Bath. Yeah. Elida could have been a possibility. They off, you know, they had offered to LCC to potentially host a game with Van Buren, and that field was still in very good shape. I mean, if Delphus Stadium Park didn't have 75 games on it between <laughs> midgets JVs, yeah. freshmen's, powder puff, and the like there on it by the end of September, Stadium Park would no doubt would get one for at least the second week just with the grass facility that they have. To me, it's indifferent. It doesn't matter. Heck, put up goalposts in the middle of Route 66 in Ottoville and play. Go for it. Who cares? I think it would work. But as you get down the line, I, I do see the uh, – the, I guess the sexiness would be the word of getting games on turf because it does bring out more people. It does bring out more people, but no matter what, both teams are playing on the same field. And I understand trying to limit the, the out, you know, what can affect the outcome of the game, but like, you know, we're not going to play indoors. So the weather's a factor. And as long, you know, as long as they're playing on the same field, I don't see a problem with Unless it. Unless anybody wants to go to Maslin and play in their <laughs> practice facility. That job's <laughs> open. Yes, it is. <laughs> great facilities. Yeah. Not great results. Nope. Ooh. All right, let's move to college football now. Ohio State, huge win over Michigan State. Mark, you were there. So, do the Buckeyes have a chance now to get into the playoff? Certainly, they're in a better position this week than they were last so week. So, let me rephrase the question. Certainly will they get into the – will yeah. they be one of the top you know, four? Th there's a lot of football yet to be played. 
things that are positive for Ohio State is the fact that Minnesota, their opponent this week, did make it into the top 25 of the college yep. football playoff committee. So on paper, Ohio State has at least one more game against a ranked foe. In all likelihood, if Ohio State wins out, which they should, based on Minnesota, Indiana, Michigan, they'll be in the Big Ten championship game against either Nebraska or Wisconsin, either one of which will be ranked in that poll as well. So there's certainly an opportunity for Ohio State to move up. Certainly they don't control their own destiny, but you look ahead of them, some of those teams ahead of them will lose another game. Things happen. Ohio State's in a good position right now. I think putting them eighth is probably the best case scenario for Ohio State coming off of the win at Michigan State. You mean those teams in the SEC West are all going to eventually knock each other off? And then they'll get into the playoffs as three losses. I was going to say, yeah, they'll have three oh, of the four just still in. Settle down. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're, they have a chance. I wouldn't say they're in a good position. I'd say they're in, uh, they're in the discussion. A lot of things have to fall their way. Well, and, and something else that helps Ohio State is you've got both Baylor and TCU in the mix. Big 12 does not have a championship game. Right. So that's one more marquee game that neither Baylor or TCU can win. Ohio State will have that opportunity for the Big Ten championship game, which, is, which would be a marquee win for them. And that'll be interesting moving forward how that works because there was always the debate that championship game can hurt mm -hmm. your marquee team because they could get beat. Well, it also can help because you get a chance for another nice win. So this year, if it plays out as you suggest and it hurts TCU and or Baylor, it might be renew the push for the Big 12 to expand to back to 12 so they can have a championship game. Kind of like, you know, you, you when you mentioned that, that marquee team, many considered Ohio State a year ago, riding the coattails of the regular season sure. winning streak to be the marquee team, and they lost to Sparty in the Big Ten championship game. I think, it, it, to use the analogy that we use with high school playoffs around here, went out and get some help. Right. That's how Ohio State makes that makes it in. Okay, absolutely. Well, it'll help that Ole Miss and Alabama, for example, two teams ahead of them in the in both polls, the AP and the College Football Playoff, will play each other this week. And like you said, I think some of those teams are going to knock each other off. It just kind of stinks that they control their own destiny and that they, if they win out, and then they're still not guaranteed to be playing for a national title. That kind of rubs well, me. Well, you know, honestly, I, I think there's maybe a section of Ohio State thought that is, let's finish fifth get everybody mad with all the talent Ohio State's got coming back <laughs> next year. Because you, you look at this Ohio State team, it's primed to win it next year. Once Braxton went down, this year almost became a little bit of an afterthought, particularly after the loss of Virginia Tech. So if Ohio State finishes fifth, and with everything that's coming back next year, ooh, a little added motivation. All right, well, let's finish up with some hoops. We're pretty close to the start of the high school season. The NBA season's been going on for three weeks now, I think. So... <laughs> Is this, does, the, does the NBA and do, do high school hoops, do they both start too early? Oh, and college hoops too, for that matter. Let's well, well, do college think, as well. You know, the funny thing about the NBA is, I've heard rumblings, they're going to back it up even farther because they generally hold off till right at the end of the World Series. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess now they're going to say, we don't care about interfering with the World Series. We're going to start even earlier. The NBA definitely starts too early. That, everybody knows that. College basketball, it's gotten way too early. High school, it doesn't. I mean, the high school seasons have really not varied much right. because they base the season really on the calendar. You take Easter and you back it up from there. So, you know, this year the boys don't start till the first weekend of December. I think that's perfect where it should be. I think the high schools get it right, and college has gotten increasingly absurd with their earlier and earlier starts. And the NBA, I mean, who cares? It's pros. They can play all year long. Nobody really cares. Well, I mean, it just seems like it doesn't matter what sport we're talking about. Every sport season yep. is getting longer. Long, they're, yep. they're starting earlier, and they're going later, and it's just elongating everything and creating more and more overlaps. Yep. You know, I, I like how it is this year, especially that for the boys, it's the first week of December. You know, for the girls, it's Thanksgiving weekend. Right. You know, it's either been that first week of December or the last week of November. Either way, I think it fits well from this area's perspective, with the exception of a couple of MAC teams every year. <laughs> most everybody's getting started on time, has their full allotment of, you know, 10, 12, 15 kids that they're going to have on their varsity basketball roster. So I think from that perspective, it doesn't matter. We've also seen it where, you know, last couple of years, a few years ago, both LCC and Elida made huge football runs. And those guys that were playing football were on the basketball court that very next week or a couple of days later yeah. texting their basketball coach, what time is practice on Monday as they're on the bus coming home so that they can play in the tip-off, you know, for those four schools that are participating in the tip-off classic. It means a lot to the kids to get underway. I think it means a lot to, you know, just in general to, you know, get basketball season here. And for some of these programs who have already packed away football, basketball can't be here soon enough. Absolutely. And just for the NBA for, for a second, 
The fact that they're experimenting with 44 minute games means that they acknowledge that there is a problem with the length of their season. Well, the, I don't think there's a problem with the length of the actual physical game. The problem, like in so many other sports, is how television is allowed to dictate right, how right. long the it's end game is. It's all about the money, is. which was yeah. the point because I was Because of make, all the TV timeouts. Which yeah. is why they'll never get fewer than 82 games in a season. We'll no. probably only add on. Has there ever been a sport that has actually cut their season and played Not less gonna games? Not going to happen. Never right. will happen. All right, well, at least high school got it right. Yes. That's going to do it and for we this. We added edition. games to high school. Yeah. And we're, we're, maybe we'll get to that point eventually. We'll see. But that's going to do it for this edition of Press Row. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on WSN.